Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Zhen from the Ohio State University. Today, I'm going to talk about our recent work, Understanding the Robustness of SSDs and the Power Fault. This is a joint work with my colleagues, Joe Tutek, Mark Lillibridge, and my advisor, Professor Feng Qing. We all know that, as we all know, SSDs are becoming an important part of the storage market. They are very fast and they consume much less power compared with hard disks. However, while we have more than 50 years of experience working with hard disks, SSDs are relatively new. How do they behave in adverse conditions is an important yet mostly ignored issue, or it is, this is, unknown, is unknown to the public. Among the many possible adverse conditions, a sudden loss of power is definitely a very dangerous one. We have been told that power faults cannot happen nowadays because of UPS, careful design, and more money. Is that true? <laughs> I think you may get the answer from this year's Super Bowl event. Actually, besides the Super Bowl, quite a few of data centers around the world suffer from power loss recently including some leading companies in this area. So if even those well-prepared and experienced data center operators cannot guarantee continuous power, it becomes critical that we understand how the highly expected SSDs behave when they lose power. This is the first step towards building a dependable storage system. So what could happen during a power loss? We must think about the potential failures before we can design a methodology to capture them. The simplest failure one could imagine is perhaps big corruption. As you may know, when SSD is programming some data into the memory cells, they inject electrons into the cells iteratively until the cells reach the desired voltage level. If this procedure is interrupted, then the half-programmed cells are susceptible to be errors. So we may observe that a well-formed record becomes corrupted by some random bits after the fault. If unfortunately the power is lost when the FTL is updating its metadata, the metadata could be corrupted too. As a result, the device could become dysfunctional and a large portion of our, of our data could be affected. In the worst case, uh, the internal state of the FTL could be messed up completely or the hardware could be damaged. As a result, the device may die and we can no longer use it at all. The fourth possible failure is Schoen writes. In a Schoen write, we attempt to write a new record over an old one, but actually only get part of our new record after the fault because a single operation may be remapped to multiple memory chips internally, and the remapping could be interrupted partially. Flying writes are also possible. For example, we attempt to write a record to the block number two of the device, but actually see it at block number one. Uh, in traditional hard disks, this failure could be caused by errors in positioning the drive head, while in SSDs, this could be caused by corruption or missing updates in FTL's remapping table. The last failure we expect to see is unserializable writes. Let's see the example here first. In this example, 3A writes three records, A1, A2, A3 in order, and we are doing synchronous writes here, which means we don't start the next write until the last write completes and becomes persistent. Both of A1 and A2 are written to the block number one of the device, and A3 is written to the block number three. If we, uh, if we see A3 on the recovered device, we can expect that all of the previous writes must have completed because we are doing synchronous writes here. In a serializable state, we see A2 at block number one. This is correct because A2 is the last record we write to this address. However, in the unserializable state, we see A1 there, which means either A2 was lost or A2 was overwritten by A1. No matter what happened, this final state is inconsistent with the serializable execution of the synchronous operations. Here, we only consider one thread. Similarly, 
Synchronous requests from multiple threads to the same address should also be completed in the order enforced by synchronization. So in total, we expect to see six types of failures, including big corruption, metadata corruption, dead device, shorn rights, and uh, flying rights, and the most complicated and serializable rights. Of course, expecting to see these failures is one thing. To actually see them is another. Injecting power force like the one shown in this photo is not a good idea. Instead, we need a carefully designed methodology. This is the overall design of our testing framework. There are four major components, a scheduler, a group of workers, a switcher, and a checker. In the first stage of testing, the workers write records to stress the SSD. Why do we stress the SSD? Because by applying intensive workloads, we can trigger many complicated internal operations, such as garbage correction and well leveling, which make the device more vulnerable to a sudden loss of power. The second stage is power fault injection. When the workers are busy writing to the device, the switcher cut off the power supply to the device asynchronously because we may need hundreds or thousands of power faults in order to observe some low probability events. It's inefficient and impractical to cut off the power manually every time. So we build a small circuit to control the power supply to the device. And the circuit itself can be controlled by a software or driver. In this way, we can injure the power fault at any time we want and bring it back later conveniently. The third stage is checking the potential failure. After bringing back the power, the checker read the content of the recovered device and check its integrity and serializability. These three stages constitute a testing cycle and the scheduler coordinates the whole procedure and tests the device again and again. So by using this testing framework, we are able to test the device intensively and automatically. The remaining question is, how do we identify different types of failures if they do happen? The secret lies in the records we write. What we write directly affects what we see and what we can detect after the fault. A naive scheme may write the same content to the device. For example, all records are zeros. This is simple, but it doesn't allow us to detect shown writes because all records are the same. How about using random numbers? This makes each record unique indeed, but it also makes a shown write difficult to understand because we don't know where the partial number, partial random number comes from. Moreover, we need additional timing and ordering information to detect unserializable rights. And in order to know something bad happened, we must know the correct content and order we are supposed to see, which means we must remember or reproduce the, uh, what we intended to write before the fault. As you can imagine, a lot of things are needed in order to perform an effective checking. Simply writing some numbers is far from enough. Here's what we do. We design a special record format which allows us to identify all six types of failures mentioned before. Each record contains a fixed size header. The first field of the header is the checksum of the whole record, which allows us to efficiently detect big corruption and show and writes. Of course, to pinpoint a show and write, we need more information, which I will tell you later. And the second field is the block number which is stores the address we intend to write a record to. By including the address within the record itself, we can check flying rights efficiently. The timestamp field tells us when the record is generated in the memory, and we can use this information to infer the order of write operations, which is the heart of unserializability detection. And the thread ID is the ID of the worker thread that generates and writes the record. This field is necessary for detecting unserializable rights from multiple threads. We will talk more about unserializable rights detection later. The opcount field tells us in which operation this record is generated and written by a worker thread. This field works together with the thread ID and a seed for regenerating the record using 
a hash function based random number generator. And by regenerating a record, we can identify different types of failures e efficiently. Besides the four failures listed here, metadata corruption and dead device can also be detected easily by writing the records because their symptoms are quite straightforward. So the header contains the necessary information for uh, identifying different failures. But some failures, such as shown writes, may depend on the size of the records we write. And the block layer in Linux kernel writes four kilobyte blocks by default. So we want to adjust the size of the record according to our needs. And we achieve this by padding the record to the desired length. Now the question is, what should we pad with? Again, if we fill in identical values, all records will become largely similar. As a result, we may miss shown rights. Also, if we use random numbers, it will be difficult to tell the details of a shown right. A much better design is to pad with copies of the header. This not only makes each record unique, but it also provides redundancy in the face of uh, corruption. Moreover, it allows us to easily tell which right was partially overwritten in a shown right. However, this is not a whole story. As you may have noticed, by padding the records with duplicates of the header, the whole record exhibits a repetitive pattern. And as you may know, some advanced FTL may perform compression on the data with regular pattern. As a result, the number of, of bytes written to the flash memory is reduced, and the number of operations involved may also be reduced. This conflicts with our desire to stress the device. Moreover, if a compressed record is messed up, it's difficult to know what really happened. So to, uh, in order to avoid the compression, we further perform randomization on the regular record. As shown in this figure, we XOR the, regu the regular record with a random mask. This creates a random format which is much less compressible. Similarly, we can recover from the random format by XORing with the same random mask again. In this way, we can avoid the interference of compression while maintaining an understandable record format. So given the special record format, the five simple failures are easy, to, are straightforward to detect. Uh, however, the unserializable rise is more complicated. And I'm not going to tell you everything here but instead, let me show you how to derive the completion time partial order of write operations, which is a key step of the unserializability detection. Ideally, we should recall the completion time of each write in order to know about the ordering. But this is almost impossible because even if we monitor the setup bus, we can only know when the command is, set, is issued and when the acknowledgement of its completion is sent. We don't know the exact moment when the data is, is written to the fetch memory. So instead of trying to use the right completion time, we make use of the generating time of records to derive the right completion order conservatively. Let's see the example here. In this example, there are two threads, thread A and thread B. A1 is the generating time of the first record of thread A. Uh, which is stored in the timestamp field of the record. And A1 prime is the completion time of writing the first record of A, which is unknown. But we know that the write of the record must be completed after the record itself is generated in the memory. Also, since we are doing synchronous writes, we know that uh, the write of the record must be completed before the generating time of the next record within the same thread. In other words, Within thread A, we have A1 happens before A1 prime, which happens before A2. The same with thread B. And between threads, the generating time also gives us a partial order because they are generated by the same system timer. Based on this information, however, we cannot determine the order between A1 prime and B1 prime. So in this case, we conservatively report no errors. Let's consider another scenario. In this case, the interest thread happens before relations remain the same. But additionally, we find that A2 happens before B1. 
So by transitivity, we can derive that A1 prime happens before B1 prime. This is how we derive the completion time partial order of right operations using the generating time of a record. And given a set of operations and the partial order information, we, uh, we can determine if the final state of the recovered device is consistent with the serializable execution of the operations. How do we actually do this is more complicated, and I'm not telling you everything here. Please refer to our paper for more details, and the algorithm can be found in Golab's paper. Besides writing special records and identifying different types of failures, Another feature of our work is we actually color power and we do it automatically through a customized circuit. The circuit controls the power supply to the SSD, which is independent from the power supply to the host. This separation of power supplies enables us to, detect, to test the device intensively without jeopardizing the host system. And as you may remember, when workers are busy writing to the device, the switcher component sends a command to cut off our power asynchronously. The command is sent at random time due, uh, within worker's working period. By sending the command at random time, we cut off the, uh, we cut off the power at a different point dur uh, during SSD's internal operations in different testing cycles. And the command is sent to the serial port as a result, none of the OS, the device driver, the bus controller, or the broad device itself have an opportunity to perform an, a clean shutdown. This is how we injure the power port. It's convenient and automatic. So by now we have seen the whole testing framework. Let's continue to see how well it works and what we have observed. We have tested 15 SSDs in total and two hard disks for comparison. The devices have a wide variety. For example, the memory chips cover both single level cells and multiple level cells. And all of the devices are manufactured in recent years. And based on our examination and manufacturer's statements, at least four of the devices have some form of power loss protection, such as supercapacitor, and the device is attached to the host system through a SAS controller. And to minimize the interference of the host system, the devices are used as low block devices. And we perform synchronized I.O. in our experiments, which means each write does not return until the data is flushed to the media. And we use direct I.O. to bypass the buffer cache. This table summarizes our results, surprisingly, 13 out of the 15 tested SDs exhibit some failure behavior. This indicates that our testing framework is effective in exposing the reliability issues of SSDs under power fault. On the other hand, two SSDs performed perfectly in our experiments. They have survived hundreds of power faults without showing any error. In total, we have observed five out of the six expected types of failures, including big corruption, metadata corruption, dead device, shown rights, and the most common unserializable rights. I cannot go through each of them in details, uh, but let me show you some interesting findings here. First of all, let's take a look at the shown rights. In our experiments, we use four kilobytes as the default record size, which is the same as the de default block size used in Linux kernel and the common page size used in SSD. And we have observed the shown rise on four kilobyte records on three devices. And this figure shows two patterns. In each pattern, the green part contains the data from a new record, and the blue part is the remaining old record. Interestingly, in all patterns, the size of the new portion is a multiple of 512 bytes. This indicates that those three devices use subpage programming technique internally, which treats 512 bytes as the minimum programming unit. 
contrary to the manufacturer's claims. The most common failures observed in our experiments is unserializable writes. We count a number of serialization errors in our experiments, which is a lower bound on the number of unserializable writes that must have occurred. In other words, we underreport the errors. In this figure, the x axis is the SSID sorted in increasing unit price, and the y axis is the average number of serialization errors per fault. And it's a log scale. We can see that some devices uh, show near 1,000 serialization errors in each power fault on average. Several design choices may contribute to this result. For example, some devices may, may not try to commit the rise immediately as requested by the host. Instead, they probably keep most of the recent write requests on volatile buffer for performance reason. Another possibility is that those devices commit, uh, update their remapping tables lazily. So although the data might have been programmed into the memory chips, the mapping table is out of date. So, and we can see that there's no strong relationship between the number of serialization errors and the price of the device, except that the most expensive single level cell devices do not show any serialization errors in our experiments. This figure further shows the, shows the patterns of serialization errors for selected devices. The, the, the X axis here is the testing cycle number, and we show 100 continuous testing cycles here. And the Y axis is the number of serialization errors observed in each testing cycle. And each testing cycle contains one power fault. And we can see that each device has a relatively stable pattern in terms of the serialization errors over time. One of the most severe failure is metadata corruption. And we have observed this failure on one device after merely eight injected power faults. Moreover, another device died in our experiments after 136 injected power faults. Although metadata corruption and dead device are two types of failures that we expect to see, and we have only observed one uh, each of them on one device, we are surprised that they are so easy to trigger. Even 136 is a relatively small number compared with what we have done on some other devices. This may indicate that some devices are particularly susceptible to power faults. So to conclude, we have proposed an effective methodology to expose the reliability issues of block devices like SSDs under power fault. The goal of our work is not to compare different SSDs from different vendors. Instead, we are trying to evaluate the failure handling capability of SSDs and provide implications to the design of the higher level storage components. For example, right ahead logging works only if the log record reaches the persistent storage before the updated data record it describes. If this order is reversed or only the log record is dropped, then the database will likely contain incorrect data after recovery. How to build dependable storage systems that can withstand all of these failures is an open question. Thank you. Uh, before saying I'm happy to take questions, I have to make a short no announcement. There was probably a power failure at the night when the conference proceedings were generated. As a result, three figures in our paper were corrupted badly. So please download the pristine version from our personal websites if you are interested. Thank you. I'm truly happy to take questions now. Akshat Aranya and EC Labs, uh, very interesting work. Uh, I'm just curious to know if uh, you've ever looked at 
what kind of errors you get when the device isn't stressed too much in the sense that no garbage collection is going on. You probably wouldn't know that garbage collection is going on, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, we are trying to trigger garbage collection, but we are not sure whether we, are, we have triggered it or not because we don't know the implementation of the fetch translation layer. We just tested it as a black box. But at uh, like lower stress values, like not running at full IOPS, for example, do you notice any difference in the distribution of errors, or counts of errors? Do we not write in using synchronized I.O.? No, you write synchronized I.O., but uh. you do 80% of the peak IOPS, for example, instead of 100% of the peak IOPS. Oh, one SSD is not stressed. Uh, we, we haven't tested when the SSD is not stressed. We color power when we apply the intensive workloads. And we have, in each testing cycle, we actually write a whole device, initial the whole devices once to fill the whole device with the correct records and then apply the intensive workloads. And we haven't tried less intensive workloads. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Don Dorner, Quantum Corporation. Interesting data, thank you very much. Thank you. You, you mentioned um, just before you presented the uh, distribution of failures, you mentioned that four of these devices uh, had some vendor indicated power protection. Can you tell us which devices in that, uh, in that list, can you put that graph up and tell us which devices in that list nominally had power protection? Yes, actually I have a backup slide here. Here. Thank you very much. This was, uh, actually this is, uh, we, we disassemble the case and to see where there are supercapacitor on the PCBs. And we can only verify that these four devices have power protection. And also some of the power protection is based on the statements of, of the manufacturers. So for others, we don't know. We cannot guarantee where, where they have power protection or not. So, uh, yeah, I cannot hear clearly, could you, yeah. Uh, to, to me, the good news on this graph is that um, in at least three quarters of the cases, the vendors who provided some form of power protection provided very effective power protection. Yes. Uh, Kiran Vijay Shankar, uh, Riverbed Technology. Very interesting work. And Thank one you. of my questions was answered just now about supercapacitors on the drives. Uh, can you tell me um, the metadata corruption was observed on one of the drives, right? Was it an SLC or an MLC, and did it have power, uh, power loss protection? Uh, I'm sorry, can you rephrase the question a little bit? So the, S uh, the SSD on which you observed metadata corruption uh, was it a drive with power loss protection, and was it an MLC or an S SLC? Oh, that one is a MLC device. And did it have power loss protection? Protection? Yeah, uh, supercapacitor. Supercapacitor. Uh, based on our exa examination, we, we don't find supercapacitor on a PCB, and it's not mentioned in the data sheet. So we don't know whether it has power loss protection or not. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> Craig Hermer from Hitachi Data Systems. Uh, I was just curious, you, uh, you cut power um, at the DC level, um, why you didn't cut power to the uh, AC power supply? It's a little more realistic and perhaps more difficult for the drives to survive because the power rails might drop independently. Uh. Um, so, summary, um, I'm curious why you didn't cut the AC power to the drive, to the power supply. Because I think this is the simplest and most efficient way we can find to cut off the power. Actually, the power... I was, just, I was just wondering if you might have seen even worse behavior if the, if the AC power was Yeah, down. that's a great point. That's possible because the curve of the power draw may be different. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. 
SW Worth, Microsoft. I'll agree with the previous content comment. Mm -hmm. You really want to look at the AC power cut. Huh. Um, Thank you. Second, using your test setup, do you have a way to measure the errors when the power comes back on, say the, the instability in the power and the inrush currents and things like that? Oh. Might be an, an interesting example for further study. Do you mean, do we wait for a certain... No, if, you, if so, after you've done your experiment, you've turned off the power, you've looked at the results, have you tried similar examples where you turn on the power very quickly and on, as the power is restored to be able to look at what the, the effects on corruption uh, instability Oh, are. yes. Actually, we need to bring back the power in order to perform the checking. So... And, and do you know where the... Do you know where the power, do you know where the errors are occurring? Is it occurring on power off or possibly on power on? Uh, <laughs> it's hard to tell. <laughs> we just check the state of the recovered device. So we don't know the exact moment when it's happened. We are sure it's happened during the power loss before our examination. Yeah. Um, Bill Belosky from Microsoft. You, it, when you talked about the devices you tested, you said you did a bunch of SSDs and two hard drives. I'm curious uh -huh. how the hard drives did. Oh, actually, the two, we didn't do much, the number of, we didn't run much number of testing cycles on the hard disks. But based on our experience, uh, one hard disk also have a small number of serialization errors, but no other types of failures. And the other hard disk is perfect under our test. Thank you. Thank you.